Hello, welcome back, anyone. So we are going to start now. Okay, the next speaker for our session will be Richard Washington. He's going to talk about understanding Congo Basin rainfall. Good afternoon to you all. A uh, word of, uh, of thanks to the uh, conference organizers for inviting me in. Very grateful to be here. I'd like to also pay uh, homage to uh, some members of the African Climate Research Group that I work with in Oxford. Uh, Amy Creese, uh, David Crowhurst, Ellen Dyer uh, are three people of a group of about 12 uh, who work on these three work on Central Africa. And also to uh, thank Wilfried Pockham as a co-author from whom I have learned uh, a lot about the dynamics of Central Africa. I've asked uh, Amy Kreese, on whose work I will draw quite heavily in this presentation, to be near one of the microphones so that she can answer all the difficult questions at the end. Right, the main aim of this work is to try and answer the question, what is going to happen to the Congo Basin rainfall in the future uh, subject to global warming? That's one of the core hypotheses, and it turns out that it's a question that we've been grappling with for the last four years or so uh, in Oxford. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the approach that we're trying to use to answer that question. And we will focus on two seasons, one which is really a dry season for much of the Congo Basin, namely December, January, and February, and uh, one core season which is wet, namely September, October, and November. And I'll finish up by um, suggesting some possible uh, benefits of running a field experiment in Central Africa, in the Congo Basin, to try and constrain the model outcomes better than we're able to at present. So let's jump right in and have a look at some plots of the uh, global uh, coupled climate models, which come from a data set called CMIP5, which map onto the last IPCC assessment. In the middle panel, you see the average of rainfall over the Congo Basin, with the vertical axis being latitude and months along the bottom. And you can see the passage of uh, rainfall through the basin in March, April, May, and then back again in September, October, um, and November. On the far left panel, you can see uh, the equivalent plot of model rainfall for the future, and then in the far right panel, the difference between them. So let's focus on the difference between because that shows what rainfall changes we can expect if you simply average all of those models together. In blue is an increase in rainfall in the future. And you can see a quite marked rainfall increase with good agreement amongst many of the models uh, towards the end of the calendar year from about August onwards. To the south in red, you can see drying. And I think what we're looking at here is not really a delay in the southward migration of tropical convection, but really an enhancement of that convection over the basin. If all of those models were perfect, and if we could guess what concentrations of greenhouse gases and sulfates and so on would be in the atmosphere perfectly, then the job would be done and the talk would be over. But unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. And this plot that we're looking at here makes uh, the case for that uncertainty quite clear. So 
So again, along the bottom, we've got months. And on the vertical axis, we've got the rainfall produced from those models. Instead, this time of showing you the average, we're looking at the spread in the simulation of those models. The red shows the historical period, and the blue, the future. So let's look at the optimistic bit uh, to start with. The median rainfall in the future is wetter in just about all months, uh, except for October. There's a large change that you see, particularly so, in November and December. And that's one of the reasons that we'll focus on uh, the December, January, February uh, dry period. Now, th this data really concurs quite well, as you'd expect with previous studies on the CMIP-5 data set. But the question is, can we believe the changes that we're looking at, particularly so the median changes, when we've got the degree of spread across the individual models that we see in these plots? How do we go about believing whether that small change is going to happen given that extreme spread in the models themselves? Well, common approaches to do this is just to check out whether the models are simulating the current climatology well. And there are many, many papers that will make that bland statement early on and answer, yes, the models are doing a good job and move on. Uh, and then the second test might be whether all the models agree in the future. That's the sort of approach that's been taken for many years now, but for several reasons is not good enough in the case of the Congo Basin. And that's largely because of the difficulty we have with the observational data sets and particularly an understanding of the atmospheric dynamics, which might be gained from upper air data, if there were any. So what approach do we take for this work? Well, what we've been trying to do over the last four years or so is get to grips with the reasons that the models simulate the climates that they do. Try and understand the key processes that bring about that rain. Try and evaluate whether the models make mistakes obvious mistakes in the simulation of the historical time period and try and work out if the future changes that the models make are then superimposed on those errors. If a model is making a change in the future based on the mistake that it makes now, then we won't have much time for a model. We can also, by looking at the processes that, the op that cause change in the atmosphere, we can establish what kinds of variables we might measure in a field experiment that would accelerate our understanding of how those models work. So let's have a look at the December uh, to February season. That's a season where we see quite a bit of change. Um, and if we start by simply looking at the averages in the model, you can see that on the right-hand panel, the change that we expect in the future uh, from the historical period to the end of the century is pretty much wetting over large parts of the basin. <clears throat> when we take a look at the individual models which make up that data set, so now we're looking at uh, several models, up to about 20 or so, we see that most models simulate drying in the south and wetting in the east of the basin. So a common response in the individual models is to rain more on the eastern side of the basin and to impose uh, a drying to the south. That uh, distinction is quite clear in the core of the basin, uh, but gets a little bit more muddled near the dividing point between the wetting and the drying in the south. These models are arranged more or less from a driest response through to the wettest response in the bottom right-hand corner. And there's one model that gets pretty much dry over most of the basin, but that itself is an outlier. The next step of this work uh, that um, Amy Kreese has, co uh, has lead authored is to establish which of that model set give us the wettest responses, and that's what you see in the top row, and which models give us uh, the least wet. So the top row is the wettest four or so, and the least wet is in the second row. The wettest models all create uh, particularly wet conditions in the east, but the wet conditions cover most of the Congo Basin. 
In the case of the models that don't change very much but do become uh, wet, you can see that the response is more or less constrained to the east of the basin. If we were to extend that uh, plot a little bit further out across the tropics into the Indian Ocean, we find that the response is bound up with some interesting dynamics in the Western Indian Ocean. And there's some very interesting work being done on the current drying in the basin, albeit in a different season, which you can see in these posters out in the foyer at the moment, posters T37 and T38. So the least wetting uh, composite has got the, really the least consistent response over the basin as a whole. Here are some of the cross sections that I was telling you about with respect to the large scale atmosphere. We're looking at plots here of latitude along the bottom axis with height along the vertical axis, uh, this being the top of the tropopause and 500 millibars being around about five kilometers or so in the atmosphere. The left hand side is the uh, wettest composites and then the least wet on the uh, right hand side and the difference between the future minus the present shown in the bottom row. And what we can see in these composites is that the wettest overlying the Congo Basin itself experience more uplift in the future and then more subsidence in the descending part of the subtropics to the south. In those uh, sets of models that don't wet quite as much, you can see the same sort of signature uh, in terms of the overturning circulation, although crucially over the core of the basin, there's anomalous descent. So that, sub, that rising air essentially weakens in the future in the case of the least setting. These are the equivalent plots, but now we're looking at longitude along this axis here with height in the atmosphere. And again, the, the left-hand side is the wettest set of models, and the right-hand side is the least wet. An interesting response in the case of uh, the future comes about through adjustments, particularly over the warm pool region of the Western Tropical Pacific, the largest collection of thunderstorms on the planet. And you can see that it's, the response is of the right sign, in other words, more uplift over the Congo Basin, but it's really shadowed out by the degree of response that we see over the West Pacific. What might be going on over the Congo Basin then uh, might be an adjustment which is coming from quite far away, pretty much the other side of the planet, where the adjustment to the largest convective region of the planet is forcing a remote response over Africa. One of the uh, variables that we found to be very helpful in diagnosing change and the performance of the models is the transport of water vapor, much of which originates in the ocean basins. And we found that calculating the route of that water vapor and also the convergence of that water vapor in the basin itself is very helpful in understanding the kind of responses that you get. Here the rows are arranged so that the most wet models are shown in the top row and the least wet in the bottom. The arrows show you the routes taken by water vapor into the basin in the lowest layers of the atmosphere. And again, the present is shown as well as the, the future and the final column showing uh, the difference between them. Blue shading shows you convergence and you can see that in the case of the wettest grouping of models, there's more convergence, more meeting of water over the core of the basin. And you can see that in the case of the least wetting models, that convergence is indeed uh, weakening, weakened in, in comparison to the very wettest models. We'll come back to this water vapor transport because we believe it is a possible variable that we can use to constrain the models in the future. But just to add extra um, dimension to this, here's a, a plot of latitude uh, versus height during December, January, February of the future rainfall change correlated with water vapor. There are four different panels showing you the correlation on the boundaries, in this case the western side of the basin, the eastern, the north, and the south. Blue correlations show that more water vapor transport is associated with more rainfall. And if you look at the extent of the response in the case of the eastern panel, it shows that to be a pretty important route in the future for likely change in water vapor transport. 
So that's a little bit on the December to February drying, uh, dry season. The forests of the Congo are pretty sensitive to rainfall given that they exist close to the margin, the lower margin of maximum rainfall, uh, that are, or the lower margin of rainfall that the forests can tolerate. So it's important that changes during the dry season don't reduce that annual uh, mean rainfall further than or lower than they already are. Let's have a look next at the September to November um, wet season. And this is a plot of the climatology of uh, a grouping of uh, models. Along the bottom, we have what we might loosely call the collection of reanalysis and satellite uh, data sets to show that climatology. Now, the interesting thing is that the ensemble of the models the average of the coupled models doesn't look particularly like any individual model. And instead, what we find is that some models are wet in, in the western side of the basin, and some models are wet on the eastern side of the basin. Very few resemble the ensemble mean where there is a spread of rainfall across the, the basin. Now, analysis that I'm going to fast track you through um, because this work is, uh, is published now in the Journal of Climate this year, is that since pretty much the beginning of global uh, coupled climate models, there's been an error in those models in the case of the tropical Atlantic where the ocean temperatures are too warm. And here you see in the uh, far left panel, in the case of the wet models, what that bias amounts to in sea surface temperature. What we've done here is simply take the wettest models and subtract the average of the sea surface temperature in the tropical Atlantic from the observed sea surface temperature about which there's little argument. And you can see that the errors in the models is around about four and a half degrees for large parts of the tropical Atlantic right next to the western side of the basin. Not surprisingly then, the wettest models are responding largely to an error in that rainfall, um, in, sorry, an error in, in the sea surface temperatures over that part of the basin. What this uh, work has done is essentially trace that error in sea surface temperatures to evaporation, the low level westerlies and the transport of that uh, evapor evaporated water off the warm sea surface temperatures into the basin. And that leads to a local enhancement of convection and rainfall. In essence, those models are, are pretty much building a, a rainfall response which is erroneous in the case of the erroneous sea surface temperatures. The eastern side of the Congo Basin, though those are models which have a maximum on the eastern side, have a more um, complicated explanation for the origin of that rainfall, which lies in part not in the tropical Atlantic, but in the South Atlantic High region stronger overturning circulation between the Atlantic and the Congo Basin and enhanced convection over land rather than the ocean over which there is anomalous subsidence. There are also adjustments to the African easterly jets that I won't go into in as much detail. Wilfried Pockham will be talking more about those, uh, those features. What does the response look like in the case of September, October, November uh, models in the future? Well, here each individual map shows us the, what the individual models do in that season in the future by minusing uh, future decades from present decades. And you'll see one characteristic response is an enhancement of rainfall over the equatorial regions and a reduction of rainfall over the regions to the south in orange. Most models share the rainfall response in the uh, northern part of the basin, and most models share the drying to the south. But there's this area near the southern edge of that red box where there's ambiguity from one model to the next. To put this in, into some context, context, you can see in the top panel, in the case of the uh, models in the west, that as the model uh, climatology increases as the models are wetter in the historical period, uh, so too are they wetter in the future. The bottom panel shows you the size of the historical climatology in relation to the change rainfall. And this is in part where the difficulties arise in the Congo Basin. The differences between the models in their historical climatology is very large compared with the small change 
that we see in the future. So what's happened next with this work um, is to identify models that are wet in the west and dry in the west. And the top row here shows the models that are wet in the west, effectively where we think there's a mistake being made in the simulation of rainfall in response to the simulation of sea surface temperatures. And in the middle panel, models that are drier um, in the west. So models which are currently dry get slightly wetter, and models which are currently wet get quite considerably wetter. One way of arguing through this, given that we don't believe the climatologies of those very wet models in the West, is to say that we think the response in the future in September, October, November might be towards wetting, but not as large as you see in the model average. If we take into account the models um, that don't have a very large bias in the sea surface temperatures and don't have a very large increase in the future, we might have a more faithful response. As is the case with the previous work, the analysis of water vapor flux and convergence has also taken place. And you can see in the first row here, the models which have a very wet climatology in the West and what that change looks like in the future. The wet models see enhanced moisture flux convergence in the West in the future, and dry models essentially feature a weakening of that convergence. So in the case of the September, October, and November season, a really important season in terms of the organization in rainfall, um, there's a case that could be made to disbelieve the really wet response in the case of models simulating a maximum in the western side of the basin. In the case of the eastern part of the basin, things are more complicated, and uh, we really need to do a bit more work on the large-scale overturning circulation to try and figure that out. We've done a similar analysis on the eastern side of the basin, which I won't go into detail in now. Um, I've taken you through the western basin preferentially. Instead, what I want to do, uh, just to, to finish up, is to talk about uh, what might be a helpful field experiment uh, that would essentially allow us to constrain those coupled climate models better in the case of the Central African region. If we look at the, the list of field experiments that have been run in North and West Africa, it's very long indeed, starting probably with uh, GATE, the Garp Atlantic Tropical Experiment, which was, I think, the largest climate experiment ever undertaken and was right on the nexus of, of West Africa. Included in the list is AMA, which is often billed as the largest land-based experiment that has ever happened, uh, as well as uh, more recent experiments, um, Waskel, Dekiwa, and so on. What about Central Africa? I don't know of an equivalent list of field experiments in Central Africa, and in a data sparse region, arguably, an intensive field experiment is the only way to accelerate our understanding and to get us where we might need to be in terms of constraining uh, climate models and their future. I've shown you evidence that water vapor flux into the basin is one possible way to go to try and understand uh, the way that the climate, uh, climate models operate. Here you see the moisture flux um, arranged for individual seasons and the correlation of that um, moisture flux with rainfall uh, in individual models uh, for those seasons. And there's a reasonable relationship. The lower the amount of water vapor going into the basin, the lower the rainfall. If we could get an understanding of how much water vapor actually gets transported into the basin, we could know which of those models was performing well and which really wasn't. This is a similar sort of diagram showing you the correlation between water vapor uh, flux into the basin in different seasons, the seasons and columns, uh, for different walls or different boundaries across the basin. And you can see that in septem September, October, November, December, January, February, uh, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and even the northern boundary are pretty important. We could begin to work to try and constrain how much water vapor actually goes over those boundaries to see what should be there rather than what the models are currently computing. 
There's evidence in model analysis that the Indian Ocean is an important source, but again, this is dependent on a model. And this is the, the work of Ellen Dyer and our research group who uh, has a poster detailing some of this in the foyer. So what might a field experiment like this uh, look like? We're hoping in the next few weeks to deploy a LiDAR system in uh, Cameroon and Yaoundé in collaboration with Wilfried Pockham and to accompany the LiDAR with some radio sons uh, and some automatic weather station data. The LiDAR um, essentially will measure uh, winds in the lower troposphere for us and the sons will allow us to understand how much water vapor is in the system. At Oxford, we've got two of these systems and there's a prospect also of uh, running one of the other LIDARs on the eastern boundary of the Congo somewhere. This will be a pilot experiment. It's uh, underfunded at the moment, but it's the sort of thing that we might be able to think about to try and constrain some of those hypotheses. So there's a summary of some of the things that I've taken you through. Um, Amy Kreese will be here as well to discuss uh, the questions on some of this work. And hats off to Amy for doing a very thorough study over the last four years. Thank you. Some question? Come to the mic. Uh, bonjour. Uh, J'aimerais savoir un peu uh, sur quelle base un peu il a fait le découpage uh, saisonnier en prenant uh, décembre, janvier, février. Parce que, euh, à ce qu'on sache un peu, c'est plus la période octobre, novembre, décembre qui, logiquement, pouvait être euh, relative de ce qui présente un peu. Donc, je veux savoir un peu euh, le critère essentiel qui a permis de faire ce découpage-là. Ça a fait un petit, un, une petite translation. C'était tout ça mon critère. Merci beaucoup. Amy is going to have a crack at Um, thank you for question. Um, so the sorry, shock me. Um, the seasonal uh, distinctions that we made were based on quite broad work across Central Africa as a region. So um, this work hasn't focused solely on the Congo River Basin. It, it extends quite a bit further um, and includes kind of the whole of Cameroon. It goes into um, just a bit further north in the, the river basin. So. Um, DJF is um, just chose, uh, chosen as a season which um, captures most of the dry season in, in this broader region that we're covering. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's reasonably arbitrary which, which seasons you look at, but um, this is in the literature on Central African climate, that's the usual distinctions that are made. I, I don't know about in hydrological research. Thank you. Okay, the next one. Any question? I'm Lee Min Cho from the University of Albany. So I have a question. So for the first part, you showed that the Congo rainfall anomalies is associated with the temperature anomaly of the Western Pacific Ocean. In the second part, you show the, the Congo alumnus is strongly linked to the ST bias over the Atlantic Ocean. How can you clarify these differences? Thank you. Should we both have a go at that, maybe? I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, one of the things that I've learned about Africa over the years is that it receives many signals, and that's part of the complication in modeling the climate. The climate system has to balance the competing effects from all three ocean basins. And there is also a local diabatic forcing, which is pretty important in the case of Central Africa. And I think one of the reasons that the models struggle to, to make faithful simulation of the climate is that they struggle to get the balance right between those local 
reinforcing elements. What we see in the coupled models is an over-response to sea surface temperatures in the tropical eastern Atlantic. And that over-response, of course, is based on the fact that those ocean temperatures are way too warm, much too warm in the models. That has the effect then of killing uh, more remote uh, teleconnections whose signals are weaker. And I think this is really at the heart of why it's such a complex system uh, to simulate. Um, yeah, just to add to what Richard said, um, I think there are kind of two elements to be to think about. Um, the SST forcings, which are important in models, do differ um, across the basin. So what this work suggests is that in global coupled models, um, there's a very local forcing from the Atlantic, which is tied up in this really warm bias there. Um, the East Congo seems to be, um, uh, doesn't really seem to be affected by that bias. Um, and has more of a remote influence from both the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And Ellen's work has also uh, suggested uh, something along those lines with the Indian Ocean being a kind of bigger player in the east of the basin. Um, and it's also important to remember that this is just within models, and this doesn't necessarily mean that those are the most important forcings in real life. Um, we've got a lot of evidence to suggest that these models are quite bad at lots of things. So um, this whole study is about understanding why models behave like they do, but um, you need to be careful and cautious before attributing that to kind of the real life climate because we know models get things wrong. We are going to take the last question. Uh, yeah, yes, a quick uh, contribution toward the, the specification of the dry and wet season. In fact, when you are in the southern part of the Congo Basin, December to March, those are the wettest period. And then maybe it will also be good to look at uh, Enzo signal, because we know that uh, La Nina and El Nino, they tend to create a drought from the southern part of uh, the Congo Basin as they come from the south. So those. Uh, in the signal, they tend to, to also change, maybe to also be good to look into those. Thank you. Okay. So we are going, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so the next speaker will be Wilfried Pokam. He's going to talk about driver of vertical motion over Central Africa. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the organizer for this opportunity to present this, uh, this result. Uh, we are going to talk about the driver of vertical motion over, over South Africa. As we have seen in the previous presentation, uh, understanding how this vertical motion is driven is important to, to explain how models behave over the region. Um, as a background, uh, we know that over Central Africa, rainfall is mainly organized within mesoscale convective system. And uh, previous studies have already identified the, the role of the mid-level convergence over the region for the development of this uh, mesoscale convective system. And also, during the main, region, the main rainy season from September to November, we know that uh, the, we have the high amount of uh, MCS over the, over the region. So on the, on the plot, on this plot, we have average the, the vertical velocity, the omega, and the wind divergence over, over the box, so over the central part of the, of the Congo. So on the tree pot on the bottom, you have the annual cycle of the average of these two variables. So the vertical motion, which is the, the contour, you have the dash contour, and the divergence, which is the shading. And as you can see, 
uh, during the rainy season, you, 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 you clearly see that we have a peak of uh, convergence, which is this uh, contour of, uh, of dial, dash line. And you, we clearly see it in each of the three analysis we have used here. And at mid-level, just below the, the, the strong uh, vertical motion, you have moisture, uh, you have wind convergence and we clearly have the same signal over the, over the trivial analysis. So this clearly shows that for the development of vertical motion over, over Central Africa, there is a, the peak of mid-level convergence and upper level, uh, upper level divergence. So in this study, in the, in the next slide, I'm going to, to check how this mid-level convergence are driven. What are the main mechanisms controlling this uh, mid-level convergence? Uh, so I will mainly focus on the mid-level circulation over, over Central Africa, uh, which is mainly dominated by the two components of the African Italy jet. This has been already identified over the region. But I will also highlight the potential role of, the, of a shallow regional circulation over the region. Uh, this, is, this circulation has been identified mainly and has an important feature for the West African uh, monsoon climate. But we think that based on our result, uh, it's something which could be also important for the, for the climate in, in Central Africa. And uh, in the second part of, of, the, of the talk, I will focus on how this uh, mechanism interact to, to shape the vertical motion over, over Central Africa. Uh, so to, to start with the dynamic of uh, the African Easterly Jet, we have on that plot, you have the meridional gradient of uh, potential temperature at lower level, so close to the surface. And the, this is the shading, the meridional gradient of uh, potential temperature. And the black line you have here is the altitude of the northern component of the African Easterly Jet over Central Africa. And the dashed line you have here is the location of the southern component. And you can clearly see that the, the annual migration of the jet closely follow the area of uh, strong surface meridional gradient over, over the region. The southern component of the jet only appear during the, the main rainy season. And you can clearly see that it's only when uh, the gradient is very strong over the southern part of uh, south of, of South Africa that we have the, the jet. And uh, based also on some uh, previous study, and because of the, the jet strict structure associated to the jet dynamic, uh, we expect strong convergence between the area over the jet, so over the Congo Basin, and divergence polar of the axis of, of the jet. And uh, this is clearly seen on, on that plot. Here you have for the season, the main rainy season, September to November, the average of uh, wind divergence again. So the brown color uh, indicate the wind convergence and the blue color indicate the wind divergence. And you have the contour showing the location of the component of the jet. And as you can see, uh, polwa of the location of the jet, you have wind divergence. And in between, you have wind convergence, so the brown color. And just uh, next to the surface, near the surface, you have uh, wind convergence. And you can see the same feature for the northern and the, and the southern component. And uh, on the top is the total circulation. And we have done the same for the isotrophic circulation. And you can clearly see that you still have this convergence 
divergence, convergence, divergence, convergence, and convergence in between. So this uh, structure of the divergence and convergence which are associated to the jet dynamic are uh, mainly driven by the isotrophic circulation. And uh, because of this structure of divergence, convergence associated to the jet, we expect a kind of a southern flow over this area. This way where there were surface convergence. Now in color you have the vertical motion. So on the previous plot here, they were, it was uh, convergence. So this lead to a kind of convergence at surface and this uh, vertical motion, just uh, southward of the jet. And we have the same feature for the northern component. And at the level of the jet, you have this convergence of winds. And uh, because of this, uh, secondary circulation, this may be associated to a kind of uh, small subsidence between the two jets. So uh, the jet may contribute to increase the mid-level convergence over the region, but because of this agiosophic circulation, it may also be associated to lowering the convection at lower level over, over Central Africa. Now, uh, as I shown previously, previously uh, the, mid the mid tropospheric convergence is associated to the dynamic of the jet. But when you look at the, the altitude of the jet, you can see that the northern component is, this is for error interim analysis, the northern component is located at 600 hectopascal from January up to September, and it dropped to 715 at, uh, during the second rainy season up to the end of the year. And oh, this is a more semitic. This should be the southern component of the jet in red. And it appears only during three months. And when it appears, it is located at 600. But you see that uh, although the, the altitude of the jet change, we still have the peak of convergence at 755 uh, hectopascal during the two rainy season. So this suggests that there should be another mechanism controlling mid-level convergence over Central Africa, uh, different from the, from the jet. And we think that this could be associated to a shallow meridional circulation over, over the region. So on that plot, you have uh, wind convergence for the 12 months of the year. And this is the average at the, in the lower troposphere, so from 925 to 815. And this is the same plot for the, for the mid-level. So the brown color is wind convergence, and the blue is wind divergence. And as you can see, over the northern part of, uh, of Africa, so north of Central Africa, you have surface wind convergence the whole year. So we can clearly see it. Uh, and just above this surface convergence, you have mid-level divergence. And this has been clearly associated to, to the shallow meridional circulation over, over West Africa. So we can see it over, over northern Africa, uh, over northern of uh, Central Africa for the, the whole year. And uh, if we focus now on what happened in the, in the southern hemisphere, so over southern Central Africa during the main rainy season, and we can see that from let's say from August to, to the end of the year, you have also a surface convergence. And just uh, above that, you have uh, mid-level divergence. So the shallow type meridional circulation we can have in the northern part of the region can also occur uh, during the second rainy season.
in the southern part of the of the region. So to clearly see this uh, shallow overturning, on that plot you have the average of meridional circulation over the region, so from the coast to the Rift Valley. So this is the average of the meridional circulation. And on the left, you have the total winds. And the middle and the right, we have, we have split the total wind into its rotational and divergent component. And if you look at the area in the green square, you can clearly see that near the surface, you have northerlies, you have uh, upwelling somewhere uh, around 10, and you have a return flow uh, between 715 and 600 hectopascal. And this doesn't appear in the rotational flow, but if you look at the divergent circulation, you have exactly the same, the same type of circulation. So you have this kind of low level overturning over, over Central Africa. Uh, and to check the drivers of this divergent circulation, uh, this circulation were split into its Latin heat and non-Latin heat contribution. And uh, this is the result on, on the bottom panel. So here you have the divergent circulation associated to the Latin heat. And uh, on the left, you have the divergent circulation, but associated to non-Latin heat, uh, non-Latin heating. So it's mainly sensible heat flux or uh, radiative cooling. And as you can see in the in the non-Latin heat component, you have this shallow meridional circulation. But one striking feature is that it seems that we also have the same kind of circulation for the Latin uh, heat component, but the upward motion in the Latin heat component, it's southward of uh, equatorial of uh, 10 degree now, and in the non-Latin heat, it's somewhere just close to 10, uh, 10 degree north. And if you look at the divergent component, you see that the location of the upward motion is exactly where you have the upward motion in the non-Latin heat. So uh, the primary drivers of this shallow meridional circulation is mainly the Latin heat circulation over, over, over the region. And this is for the first rainy season, and we have done the same for the second rainy season, and we is not very strong as in the first rainy season, but we still have this shallow meridional circulation. So we think that the peak of uh, mid-level convergence over Central Africa at 750, it's also associated to this uh, shallow meridional circulation. So to, to summarize, this plot summarizes a bit what we have at uh, mid-level over, over the region. We have chose four months across the year, and uh, at the beginning of the year, the winds is dominated by northerlies, and it changed progressively to southerlies uh, at the middle of the year. And uh, we can see that in the months associated to rainy season, so in April and uh, October, it's mainly westerly, so the meridional circulation is very weak. And we can clearly see it also on this diagram, which is the average of the meridional component of the winds over that box. And you can see that uh, in the first part of the year, it's negative. It means that the circulation is dominated by northerlies, and at the end of the year also, and in between is dominated by South Ellis. We have positive value here. And during months of the rainy season, it's a uh, wind convergence. So we have convergence from the north and from the south. That's why we have a value close to zero. Uh, and the Central Africa region is bordered by dry 
area in the north and in the south. So we have the Saleh region, which is dry and warm, and also the southern part, we have the Kalahi Desert somewhere here. So it's a region which is also dry and warm. Uh, so because of this uh, mid-level uh, winds, regional winds, we, could, we, could, we can expect uh, an advection of warm and dry here at mid-level over, over Central Africa. And uh, we clearly see that we are not agree in the location of the high humidity over, over West Africa. And to clearly s check this contribution of uh, mid-level avection, uh, the better thing would be to compare this avection between wet and dry years to see if this mechanism is stronger during dry years than wet years. And because of the problem of uh, quality of uh, rainfall data over the region, to, to check uh, or to choose wet and dry years over the region, we have focused on analysis on a paper already uh, published, which have been, uh, this paper have shown the strong spatial variability of, of uh, rainfall at interior time scale over the region and have identified region homogeneous in terms of uh, this variability. And we, in the next, we will focus on the region five, which is the coastal region and region two. And we, you can clearly see here that for the two regions, the wet and the dry years are not the same. So you, have, you can have details of all this on, on paper of uh, Desfolia and Nicholson. So we will check how this metropospheric advection occur, what makes the difference between wet and dry years for these two regions, for the region two and region, region five. And to check it, we have plot the profile of uh, equivalent potential temperature for the two regions. So uh, and we made it for the wet and the dry years. And you can clearly see that there is a clear difference at mid-level between wet and dry years. There is this kind of uh, sodwar excursion, this sodwar movement of lower value of uh, equivalent potential temperature, which indicate that during dry years, there is a kind of uh, straightening in advection of dry air over the metroposphere in, uh, in Central Africa. And this can also seen in the, in the coastal region, in region five, where it's straightened a bit over, over 700 tecopascal. And to check the mechanism beco uh, be uh, behind this uh, dry avection, here you have the geopotential high during dry years at the uh, 700 hectopascal in the two left panel for the two region. And uh, you can clearly see that there is uh, mid tropospheric high over uh, southern part of uh, uh, the African continent and also uh, in the north. And this uh, contribute to advection of this dry air over, over the region. And during dry air, so on the left, on the right panel, you have the same plot, but the difference between wet and dry years. Uh, so the negative ma value means that there is a decrease in geopotential high, means that there is a decrease in, uh, in pressure. And uh, we can see that in the northern part of the continent, there's a decrease in, in pressure. And this leads to awakening the, 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 the northward uh, execution of dry years. So you can see that over this area, the row is uh, opposite to the direction of the wind here. It means that during, uh, uh, wet, uh, during wet years, it weakens this circulation. And we also have the same thing over, over the southern part of the continent. So we have a weakening of this uh, dry avection over, over the region. And we can see the same thing for the, for the region five, which is the coastal region. But 
we can, uh, something which is also interesting is that the feature associated to each region is different. So although the result is the same for each region, but you can see that between wet and dry years, the, the pattern is not the same for, for both regions. This could explain maybe why you have this difference in terms of year of uh, wet and dry years between the two regions. And this is the same kind of plot, but at the surface. And again, here, during dry years, you have near the surface this strong northerlies, which bring dry years close to the surface. And during wet years, you see the row, uh, you have the opposite. So it means that this circulation weakens during, during wet years. Uh, and again, you have the same pattern for the coastal region, but uh, you have the same uh, awakening in this circulation. But again, as you can see, the pattern of uh, geopotential is very different because we don't have this strong decrease in, uh, in high for the, for the region too, which is the, the eastern part of the, of the, of the Congo. So, and this is the result for the vertical motion. Uh, as you can see, because of the dry avection, there is a, the area of vertical motion na is narrow at mid-level, and it's, it is reduced at upper level, as you can see, during dry years. And we can have it for region two and uh, region five. Okay, so, just to summarize, uh, we think that there is a need to continue to improve this uh, understanding of the mid-circulation over, over Central Africa, and mainly uh, also focus on, instead of looking only mechanism uh, contributing to enhance convection, we also have to check mechanism we can uh, inhibit convection over, over the region. Thank you. Okay, you can go. Okay, my name is Andreas Fink from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Thank you, Wilfred, for this very nice presentation. I have a question and it's perhaps more a remark. We have to be cautious because none of these reanalysis really resolve the mesoscale convective system dynamics. And from West Africa, we know that uh, at, let's say, lower levels, era interim doesn't show any convergence, but yet the systems grow because they cause their own convergence once they are going. So um, we really need to know what you know, uh, errors we make when we make these um, conclusions based on reanalysis that don't know about mesoscale convective systems. And also, I mean, this is a response more to Richard Washington's talk, uh, the Sahel, which is an extreme end where all the rainfall comes from these very, very intense mesoscale convective system. The humidity control on rainfall is very weak. So we need to know for the Congo, what is the role of these highly organized mesoscale convective systems for the rainfall? And then I think uh, we have a better understanding of what um, errors we do. So I'm think the work is very good. It gives us a very good hypothesis, but the link to the mesoscale convective systems needs to be done. Uh, okay. Can I say something? Or? Yeah, <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, the, uh, we have introduced by uh, saying something about the mesoscale convective system, but the idea was not to uh, identify with this mechanism or to explain why we have a high or low quantity of MCS between the two seasons. It's where only to better understand how the mid-level convergence were, were driven.
Okay, thank you. The next, okay, you can go to the mic. Uh, first of all, enjoying your presentation very much. My question is actually related to previous question. In the poster session, there's a very nice uh, study suggests uh, the, this wet and the dry period is associated with a low level vertical wind shear. And perhaps, uh, I mean, my question is really the relative role between these uh, shallow convection, which bring moisture to the a lower middle troposphere, and that actually has been shown globally. That's that's quite important for deep convection, whether it's a local driven or mesoscale convection, as showed by recent paper uh, from David Neeling's group. Um, but on the other hand, the mesoscale convection is a dominant process of rainfall. So uh, I think it will be really uh, beneficial to look at the uh, Easily, Africa easily jet influence on both uh, low level vertical uh, wind shear as well as the shallow circulation and its impact on moisture in the lower middle top. Okay. Thank you. The next question. Okay. We are going to thank, uh, to thank uh, Wilfried for his presentation. So. Okay, so the last presentation will be done by Sharon Nicholson. I want to start off by saying not only how pleased I am to be here, but how pleased I am to see so many participants from three different continents here. So I think we're going to have a wonderful meeting here, and I especially want to thank Doug Alsdorf. He's worked tremendously hard in getting everybody here. So now, um, I guess I need to pull up my presentation. <clears throat> I'm not good with this kind of a computer. Uh, anybody want to? <laughs> okay, traditionally, <clears throat> the seasonal cycle throughout tropical Africa. I was looking, oh, I was looking for the, uh, oh, okay, thanks, that's what I was looking for. Traditionally, the seasonal cycle over all of tropical Africa has been associated with the um, north-south migration of what's called the intertropical convergence zone. Now, over the years, I've been starting to question this idea for many reasons, one of which is that there's a lot of different meaning of what is the intertropical convergence zone. Some authors look at rainfall, some authors look over at other variables, some authors look at cloudiness. In this talk, I would like to start off by looking at the ambiguity of the concept. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about the historical development of the concept, which I'll have to say was very, very shocking to me that when I looked into it, I found out how shoddy the development was. Then I'd like to talk about reasons why I don't think it works over equatorial Africa. Um, so let's start off by looking at different definitions. I've got a fat thumb here and it keeps, what am I doing here? Okay, these are different definitions that have been given for the intertropical convergence zone. And as you can see, they're all based on different types of atmospheric parameters. 
Some look at pressure and convergence, some look at rainfall and convergence, some look at rainfall and something called outgoing long wave radiation. Now, if you take a look also in the literature <coughs> at the different parameters that have been used to track the so-called ITCZ, we have the pressure minimum, we have the surface wind convergence, we have the rainfall maximum, we have the vorticity maximum, we have the outgoing long wave radiation minimum, and the cloudiness maximum. Now, if you want to take a look at this thing moving around, how can we compare from one paper to the other when we have so many different definitions? Now, if we go a little bit further and talk about how this concept developed and how it was linked to tropical rainfall, it actually has a very interesting historical development. It really goes back all the way to the Hadley model of atmospheric circulation in 1735, where Hadley talked about a two-cell model with rising motion close to the equator and sinking motion in the subtropics. And essentially what that gave us was this view of rising motion in the equatorial convergence zone and sinking motion in the subtropics. Now, as it turns out, that part of this was an attempt later on, the development of the ITCZ concept, was to try to find something parallel with mid-latitude frontal concepts that were being developed around the 1930s. Okay, if we have fronts in the high latitudes, we should have some sort of a front in the uh, tropics as well. I would like to show this with the laser pointer, but I can't get the laser thing to work on here. So, oh, wait a minute, is this? In any case, what you can see is that the, this was one of the first attempts to define the ITCZ, and basically, as I said, just trying to find something comparable to the frontal concepts. We were able to define it in the summertime, but even these original diagrams did not try to define an ITCZ in the winter, either over Africa or over South America. Now, unfortunately, despite that, it was shown that you tend to have a seasonality in the tropics that would actually fit in with the ITCZ concept. That in the outer tropics, you have one rainy season during the course of the year, and in the inner tropics, you have two dry seasons and two wet seasons when the ITCZ crosses the equator twice. So publication of this really, I think, led to the idea that the ITCZ drives the seasonal cycle. But more than driving the seasonal cycle, a lot of climatological literature tries to interpret year-to-year -year changes in rainfall, decade-to-decade -decade changes in rainfall in terms of the intensity or location of the ITCZ. Now, after this diagram was published of trying to support the concept, there was another diagram published, <coughs> which is what we tend to see here is the final version of where the ITCZ is. But the way this came about was a couple of people had different ideas about what the general atmospheric circulation looked like. They couldn't agree, so they kind of reached a compromise, and in their compromise, that's where they put the ITCZ over Africa. And that's generally the diagram that you see quite frequently. Now, as you see, this is the diagram you saw from the last diagram. This comes from a paper that I wrote in 1988. <laughs> again repeated in 1996. And Doug's <laughs> shaking his head over there. Well, we all make mistakes. And I get very embarrassed nowadays when I try to claim that the ITCZ doesn't exist there, yet I published this. But in any case, so I'm going to be challenging myself throughout the rest of the talk and try to show you why this idea doesn't work. Now, what really surprised me in looking at the history of the concept was that it's been controversial since its inception. Now, I don't want to read to you every one of these, con um, these comments, but for those of you who are not meteorologists, I will tell you that these are some of the most eminent meteorologists of their times, Paul Main and Newton, that was the Bible of atmospheric circulation, 
real was the, the, the Bible of tropical meteorology. Barry and Chorley is a widely used textbook. Wallace and Hobbes, very eminent. They don't even mention the ITCZ in the book that they use, which most of the atmospheric science departments use to introduce uh, circulation. Krishnamurti doesn't mention it. So there was certainly a lot of controversy there. But what shocked me even more was when I looked at comments from those who really work in Africa. And Obasi is a Nigerian working in Kenya, for example. Um, he said that the ITCZ plays no role in forecasting in East Africa, although it was used in that context. Um, Hostinrat, who also wrote one of the classical books on the climate of the tropics, calls for an abandonment of these outmoded notions. And LaRue, who I really thought was going to support the idea, wrote in his very, very well-known book on the climate of Africa, he provides a scathing review with at least one or two chapters devoted to saying why the ITCZ concept doesn't work. And I liked the last comment that he made. He laments that such terms as the ITF, or intertropical front, and ITCZ are inappropriate but hallowed by use. I think it says it all. We've always defined the seasonal cycle interannual variability in terms of the ITCZ. It's convenient, it's easy, so we keep doing it. Now, what I'm going to try to argue today is that we need to get away from that. And fortunately, in the meteorological community, people are accepting the idea that we need to abandon that concept. I'm trying to get that idea uh, sort of spread into other communities like hydrology, paleoclimate, et cetera. Now, I want to start off by looking at the question of the ITCZ in West Africa, because there really is an ITCZ over West Africa, but it has very little to do with rainfall. And that idea has become very, very widely accepted. Now, if you take a look at the wind convergence, you do see that the August um, time period does look like what we have here. But the convergence in January, that big blue area, doesn't look anything at all as the traditional view of where the ITCZ is in January. Now, this is an, a paradigm that I had published of what the circulation really does look like over West Africa. And as it turned out, at about the same time, the group that were involved in the AMA experiment published something very, very similar. And what you see is a huge area of vertical motion here. And that vertical motion essentially lies between the axis of the African easterly jet and the tropical easterly jet. The ITCZ is over here, and it has the type of uh, shallow meridional circulation that Dr. Pocom was just talking about. And what you can also see is there is a huge area of subsidence between the ITCZ and where you have vertical motion and rainfall. So this is a very, very different picture that basically says, at least over West Africa, we have a surface convergent zone in summer, but it's completely decoupled from the systems that produce rainfall. Now, if we go from there, well, I guess I went backward. Why am I not going forward here? Uh oh. Okay. Ah, okay. I had to, my computer, my computer with my presentation that I was working on died Saturday night. And I had to try very quickly to patch something together in another computer. And this is. I couldn't send both halves of the presentation at the same time, so there's a little bit of a glitch in trying to <laughs> put the two patches together. Okay, in any case, so what I was getting at with West Africa is in the literature, people start using, instead of the term ITCZ, terms like the rain band, the equatorial rain belt, and my own preference is tropical rain belt. So we think of the seasonal cycle as the tropical rain belt moving across the equator. Now, oh geez, uh, okay, what this should have said, I believe, is that 
There really is no ITCZ over equatorial Africa. And what I want to do to demonstrate that to you is to look first of all at what would be suggested by the ITCZ. The definitions that are given suggest that you should see a discrete zone of low level wind convergence close to the surface across equatorial Africa during the rainy season that you would see a systematic displacement north and south of that rain maximum with the season, that you would see a deep column of vertical motion throughout that region associated with that, and that you would also see a coupling of the uh, ITCZ with that region of ascent. Now I'm gonna try to go a little bit slower for the next sort of diagrams because the diagrams I'm going to show are intended to illustrate that each one of these points is not true. So that the, each one of these is basically absent, so we really do not see much of an ITCZ in the equatorial region. Now, this kind of completes the diagram I showed you earlier. We looked at January and we looked at August. But what do you see during the main rainy seasons? You are seeing at low levels, you're seeing divergence. You're not seeing convergence that you need for an ITCZ to be there. You're seeing the pink. You see some areas like the area to the south that um, Dr. Pocum showed earlier, but right in the heart of the Congo Basin. We don't have a convergence zone that's producing the rainfall in either April or November or the rest of the rainy season. So that kind of disputes point number one. And this just reiterates the picture that throughout the region we have pockets of low level convergence, pockets of di low level divergence, but nothing like that discrete zone that we see up in the north of the red level of convergence up there. It just is a completely different situation. Now the second thing is we're going to be looking at things along these three transects to see how things advance during the course of the season. In the western area, the central area, and I think I've left the eastern area off of here because that's not so critical for the Congo Basin. But let's take a look at how things change over time. We're looking at the three months of the first rainy season, March, April, May, and three months of the second rainy season, October, November, December. I realize that this is not the distribution of the rainfall months everywhere in the Congo. It changes very much from north to south. But this represents, I guess, much of the area. And what you would expect to see if it really was the ITCZ simply moving back and forth is that you would see a relatively even area of rainfall in each month, and you would see that move back and forth. Well, take a look at 25 degrees east in March, April, May. You do not see any shift in that location. Um, up in the northern area, you see an expansion to the south. You're definitely not seeing a migration there. You're seeing changes in the size. And the same thing up in March, April, May at 16 east, which is the western equatorial region, western Congo Basin, you do see the anticipated north-south movement at one location that's 25 degrees east in the Congo Basin in October, November, December, uh, yet most of what you're seeing is an expansion of that zone of rainfall. So in any case, that also doesn't shows you really don't see this simple migration of the zone where rainfall is high. Now thirdly, where do we have vertical motion? This is a plot of something called omega, which is vertical motion expressed in terms of changes of pressure. So anything that is negative is strong vertical motion. And we do see some cores of strong vertical motion, but they are not linked to these low level convergence zones that you see up to the north and up to the south. So that's another example of how this doesn't fit the idea of ITCZ moving back and forth and creating the rainy seasons. Now, the question is, if the ITCZ is not what creates a seasonal cycle, what does create a seasonal cycle? 
And my own belief is that we really don't know this yet. But in getting back to the hypothesis of the session, which is that factors are different across the equatorial region, there is no common denominator, that's something that we can see here. If we look at the Western sector, and um, Dr. Um, Pilkram talked a lot about this with the African Easterly Jet, we see something in Dr. Despoli's papers earlier, he showed this as well, that in the Western region of equatorial Africa, the same factors play a big role as they do in the Sahel. The rainfall being between the axes of the Easterly Jets, low level Westerlies playing an important role. If we go instead to the Central Basin, this is from a paper by one of my former students, um, Jackson, it was published I think probably about seven years ago. This shows the vertical motion throughout equatorial Africa and what you can see is there is a ring of divergence surrounding essentially the Congo Basin, that is the dark colors here. You have an area of convergence around that and then you have an area of convergence right in the center. Now I didn't know, um, I was a co-author on the paper and I didn't know what to make of this, but one of the reviewers who uh, obviously knew a lot about orographic effects said that what we're seeing here is orographic effects. This light color where we have the convergence is air ascending over the mountains during the day. When it's ascending over all the mountains around the basin, it's pulling air out of the basin and creating that divergence which is what we see in the dark colored ring there. What produces the little bit of convergence in the middle is when all that air from the mountains sinks down into the basin and converges at night. In any case, I'm sure this is not the only factor, but unlike in the west and in the east, this is a, a factor that we're gonna have to take into account in trying to understand the meteorology of the Congo Basin. Uh, one other factor, and this is something that was brought up by Dr. Fink just a minute ago, is that most of the rainfall there is in fact produced by mesoscale convective systems. And at the top, you have the percent of the mesoscale convective systems, the percent of the rainfall that's produced by these systems. And you can see that over equatorial Africa, west of the East African highlands, there's anywhere from 60 to 70% of the rainfall produced by these systems that comprise only about 2% of the systems that bring rainfall. So if 2% of the rain bearing systems produce 70% of the rainfall, in order to understand the central basin, we really have to understand the links between these convective systems and the large scale. And Finally, in East Africa, again, this is one place where there at least has been, I think, some, um, some better understanding of the seasonal cycle. There was a paper published in 2015 by Yang et al. that looked at the wet season and looked at several thermal dynamic variables. They looked at monsoon winds, they looked at Indian Ocean SSTs, and they found that this really played a big role. It wasn't the IPCC. It was the thermodynamic state, which is produced by the, uh, the march of the solar radiation, monsoon winds, SSTs, and the direction of winds with respect to the oceans. I would also like to add a factor that I have started looking at, it's something called the Turkana Jet. You have this very narrow channel in between the mountains, and you have a low-level jet stream that you're seeing here. Now, that jet stream was detected Oh, I think in the 1980s, the, those doing the um, pilots who were taking people into the Turkana Channel, when it was, the lake was called Lake Rudolph, they were doing early man studies. And the pilots complained bitterly of all of the turbulence that they had to experience flying into Lake Turkana. So there was a field experiment done in the early 80s that demonstrated that that turbulence was, low, was related to this low level jet stream. And people that work on the lake there complain also of the tremendous waves on the lake linked to this jet. In the recent work that we've done, we are suggesting that this jet 
plays a major role in the interannual variability in the region and that it plays a major role in creating the aridity in the eastern portion of the equatorial Africa. That's east of the Congo Basin. Nevertheless, if we look across the equator, this is, again, evidence that we have very different factors throughout that region that are playing a role. And this fits in with comments that were made earlier about the complexity of what we're seeing here. I suspect there are very few places in the world in which the number of factors affecting the seasonal cycle, the interannual variability, the future, is as great as what we're seeing over equatorial Africa and in particular in the, um, in the Congo. I think that is my last, and these are my conclusions, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my concern is um, on the role of the Indian Ocean. There's been some kind of debate around this subject matter. So uh, you're an expert, and uh, I would like to have some clarification regarding how the Indian Ocean actually contributes to precipitation in the Congo Basin. So basically what we do, so we analyze the two real analysis data set and they try to link the drought of the Congo versus the, the, the SIT variation over Indian Ocean, West Pacific Ocean. So basically it's strong warming over that particular regions that enhance the water circulation, eventually enhance the substance over the Congo Basin and reduce convection and the rainfall. Please, Sharon, you can speak on the microphone because we don't benefit oh, of the translation. Thank you. Oh, did you want me to repeat what I said earlier? Or? Yeah. Oh, what I said was that one of my students found that most of the mesoscale convective systems bringing rainfall to the Congo start off in the highlands of East Africa, in the Rift Valley Highlands. And that area is very much controlled by things that happen over the Indian Ocean. So my gut feeling is that the Indian Ocean probably does play a big role in influencing the Congo. But what makes, um, you didn't quite ask this, but I think it's related. What is so important in understanding the Congo rainfall regime is that the vertical motions over the continent there are related to three vertical cells of overturning that don't have much room between them. So you have one set of cells creating vertical motion over the Indian Ocean, you have one set over the Atlantic, and you have one over the continent. And so the response to the Congo is probably a response to variations in all of these so that the Indian Ocean alone could not influence things, but we're going to be seeing kind of a trade-off between the Atlantic cell, the Pacific cell, the Indian cell. But it's just incredibly complicated, and as I said earlier without the microphone, there's probably few places in the world where the rainfall regime is as complex as that in the Congo in terms of factors.
Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I will start with your last point about these cells you have explained about the, the tree ocean. But uh, at the same time, so when you look at the, the annual migration of the tropical rain belt, it also follows the annual migration of the solar insulation. Oh, sure. So sure. Uh, does it mean that uh, uh, the, the organization of convection could, could come from this system, but it's amplified with the migration of the sun, or? I, I think that's why you'd have to interpret it. I mean, the, the statistics are very clear that the rainfall is produced by a very, most of the rainfall comes from a small number of systems. And as um, uh, Dr. Fink pointed out, there are certain environmental conditions that help to trigger that convection. Um, part of it would be the migration of the sun, part of it would be the migration of the jets that move, as you've shown, along with those temperature gradients. Um, so yes, I would say that clearly a migration of the rain belt or the conditions producing it are, are making conditions conducive to the development of those systems. But it's been, we've been, I've been working with Dr. Fink trying to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> And we're finding it's very complicated. And just like the remarks I meant earlier about not completely trusting the rainfall data in recent times, we're having trouble trusting even the wind data we're getting from reanalysis data. And we're thinking that some of our results or lack of them were due to the problems in the reanalysis data. So yes, it's all tied in together, but it's gonna take at least a decade of work to figure out exactly how, I think. Um, the, these moments sometimes mark a depressing pause in where we think we're at, in the sense that we're making progress by taking a step backwards. And if you combine the comments that Andreas made about MCSs with uh, what you said uh, now, um, it means that most of the data sets that we have to hand can't do the job. But perhaps the step forward comes in, in some sort of consensus among us as a group about what we could use, usefully measure. Um, and I've seen examples of where field experiments have really accelerated understanding in, in a very short period of time by getting to grips with the processes that are missed by the crucial numerical products that we rely on. Well, I, I would agree with you completely, and I would add to that, not just an experiment, but I personally believe that by hand, uh, putting in a handful, even as few as a dozen, well-placed automatic rain gauges over the Congo Basin would go a long way to getting better satellite retrievals of rainfall in the region, as well as even better reanalysis data, because in what we're referring to with, for those of you who are, might not know what a reanalysis data set is, it's using a combination of observed data and models to create a data set that's easy to use. But what we've seen is these reanalysis products are no better than the data that go into them. And if you don't have any data over the Congo Basin to go into them, you're not going to get good results. But just adding a few places with real measurements, and again, things that were pointed out here, trying to combine this with hydrological indicators, which I hate to say this, but I trust them more than the rain gauges right now. I think we can move forward that. And I think your idea of the Experimental program is an excellent one. I, I would like to add to this. So first of all, I'm totally with Richard. We need experiments. We need only, only also need, I think, upper air information. So I did four oh. campaigns in West Africa and I can tell you uh, they really advanced our understanding. And one issue is in the, you might have heard there is this new satellite, Aeolus satellite, which measures wind, but only in the middle and upper uh, troposphere. So it will, uh, you know, uh, give us a backup picture of the tropical waves like Kelvin waves and MGO. But still, what goes on in the lower levels of the Congo basin? And I mean, slight changes in the wind make a large change in the, you know, low level moisture field. So. 
I think we would need better data, but also better data not only on the ground, but a little, you know, data to validate um, the the models uh, and, and also the reanalysis yeah. of the Congo. Uh, thank you for making that comment, and I couldn't agree more, and I'm glad you reminded me of the issue of upper air data. Um, one of the things that uh, Andreas and I were looking at was trying to figure out what reanalysis models would work. And the first thing I did was try to validate ideas I had earlier that have been well accepted about what creates the interannual variability of rainfall over West Africa. And those ideas required that the African easterly, sorry, the tropical easterly jet get really intense again now that the rains are coming back. And we started looking at the reanalysis data sets, and they were just not showing it. The magnitude was not getting what we had expected, given how well the rains have, they haven't completely recovered, but they've started recovering. And when we looked into it, we found out that if you really looked at radioson data, the real observations, yes, the tropical easterly jet has come back and has gotten intense again, but the reanalysis studies never saw that. And we were able to show with just a handful of radiosons that the jet really has recovered. And uh, what I'm trying to say with this is even if it were an international effort were, that were required to do so, because I know it's expensive to send up radiosons and pie balls, I think the Congo Basin region is important enough meteorologically speaking in a global sense that WMO or somebody ought to invest in four or five upper air stations to make them operate in the Congo. I think that could improve an awful lot in, in, in our models. Thank you. We are going to thank Sharon for his presentation. <laughs> so for now, we are going to the poster station, and then after, there will be two groups, one in French, led by Jean Maï and Ajay, and the English one will be with me and Christopher. Thank you.